Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 198 for Monday, January 28th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that's by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash gig gab, where we'll talk about the deal you get and why you want to get it shortly here, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? Quite well, Mr. Hamilton. How was your weekend? Uh, my weekend was good. We finished our run of our second run, if you will, of uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And uh, it was, man, what a pleasure that show was to do. Of course, I, I it just for anybody that's paying attention. Yes, this is the show that I tried my hardest to get out of uh, back in December, not because I didn't want to do the show itself, but because of the logistics and everything that you know, that the, they were that they were sure. asking for. Um, the nice part was that they couldn't find anybody else. So they came to me at the last minute, hmm. which meant that because I knew myself, I knew even if they said, oh, don't worry, you don't have to come to these other rehearsals. I would feel like I, I needed to be there, you know, for the sake of the production. And I would have gone out of my way to do that and sacrificing other things that I really couldn't afford to sacrifice. So uh, by saying no, I had no uh, drive to go to those rehearsals because they weren't for me. And then it was, hey, the show's in like a week and a half and we still don't have a drummer. So here's the deal we can offer you today. And you really only need to come to two rehearsals and come and do the show. <laughs> it's like, hey, that's what I thought the deal was going to be at first. So it all worked out really, really well. Okay. And uh, the show that that show is so much fun it, because it's a show about a rock band. Uh, and and largely, of course, about the singer in the rock band telling her story, his story, depending on your your choice of gender pronouns. Um, and and they change throughout the show. So uh, but, uh, it, you know, so we were on stage. We were part of it. We could see everything that was going on. And and there was no like when I say there were no concerns about volume and level, I mean that like. I've played rock gigs where I had to play quieter than I did for this one. Um, you know, I, like it wasn't like we intentionally played at a, at an ear splitting level, but we played at whatever level felt comfortable for us. And that was great in the theater. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really was a blast. And the band was, it was a, it was a kick-ass band for this. We really had good players and everybody, everybody took care of everybody else. In fact, our last show on Saturday night, um, we had a couple of moments where like we it really was us all taking care of each other. We got to the end of actually the first tune, which is a pretty heavy rocker. And uh, and our guitar player, Ken, looks at me and and kind of points. He's like, hey. And I realized my uh, the tip of my stick had broken off probably during the ending. And if I had hit the drum one more time with it, it would have put, you know, would have gone through the head. Um, oh. Yeah, because that's what, you know, that's the, the broken <laughs> stick, you know, it turns into a knife usually. And he knew that, right? You know, he's a seasoned guy, too. And, uh, and so I was like, oh, cool. Thanks for having my back. And then two songs later, he starts the tune and it kind of vamps a little bit with this. It's this like country guitar sort of thing that sort of goes and, and we wait for some stage stuff to happen. And then I kick in the tune. And Victor, our other guitar player, about halfway through his little vamp of just of Ken's vamp, just holding this thing. He's like, hey, man. And I can see he's trying to get his attention. And finally he does. And Ken has this old crap look on his face. He's got the capo on the third fret instead of the fourth. So he moved it before the before anything <laughs> kicked in and before any disaster happened. But it was like, all right, we really do have each other's backs here. Like, this is good. Like it, a real band. Like, a, yeah, exactly. It was a real band. And, and you know, these things happen uh, to real bands. They, you mm -hmm. know, they're real things that happen. And, uh, I, you know, it was just part of the show. It was like, yeah, there's really no fourth wall in that that Hedwig show. But, um, yeah, it's, it was a really interesting show cause, because we had these moments like, it, there were large, mo long moments of of band silence where dialogue was happening and, and Hedwig was telling her story about, you know, how she became Hedwig in this whole, you know, craziness. And and then, you know, like a song would would emerge out of this. And um, 
And uh, most of these songs, not all of them, some of them were sort of tender, but most of these songs were pretty heavy hitters and had like big, monstrous, like rock endings. In fact, one ending had to last for probably three minutes with us just, just like a held ending. Yeah. Like mayhem three happening. Minutes? Yeah. It's the longest rock ending I've ever played in my life. And we had to do it every night. I, like to the point where when we finished, I was spent like, you know, mm. arms stiff because you're just playing like, you, you know, basically everyone's soloing with this cacophony while uh, Hedwig's going through this, you know, moment on stage and the, the strobes are flashing and it's just this sort of over the top thing playing at the top of our, you know, like it's speed and, and volume and all of this. And uh, and then it finally dissipates. And what's cool is it it um, the, the next song has sort of a big ending that also dissipates into a moment where nothing happens on stage for probably another three minutes. And it's it's meant to be this very sort of awkward moment for the crowd because Hedwig's just standing there in in his underwear doing nothing. And the house lights are at full like you basically might as well have work lights on. Right. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think the work lights came on, but if somebody turned them on, you never would notice. It's just like full brightness throughout the entire theater. And it's this really awkward moment for the crowd because the band and it, like no one on stage moves for like three minutes. And um, the crowd, usually most nights, the crowd would applaud and then stop applauding. And on Saturday, somebody like, you know, started clapping again and then stopped. But but Jason, who played Hedwig, would just wait until there was like many minutes of silence before he sort of moved on to the next thing, which was the last tune. And um, and it was a cool moment because, you know, there I was on stage and I would just close my eyes and meditate for a few minutes until I heard Ken come in with the guitar riff to to start the final song. But um, it was cool, you know, craziness. So fun show to do. I'm very glad I did it. Hopefully we'll Good. Yeah. Hopefully it we'll do it like again. You, yeah. You've had a, quite a, a ride in kind of organizational conversations about that one. I'm glad it worked out well for you. Yeah, no, it was a it was a fun show. And everybody involved, of course, was was fantastic. Um, so so yeah. the House Rockers had kind of a fun thing thing this weekend we did our kind of yearly photo shoot so i try to get our our band's photos redone every year for a few reasons one just have some fresh things to send out to people two if there's been any changes in our band makeup you know i want to have the right guys in the in the photo sure uh, that type of thing so and but it's kind of a thing because i got to coordinate 11 guys on on an off day usually we usually do them on a saturday or sunday morning uh, I got to get the photographer lined up and I got to get a place to do them. Right. right. So, you know, there's a, quite a few moving parts to this and lucky. I have this friend who's a great photographer. I mean, he's essentially a professional photographer who just happens to have another day, day job, but it's Richard Karras. Rich, he's a friend such of a mine. good guy. I love such that a guy. good guy. Yep. Yeah. So we yep. know Dave and I know Richard from our day job life. Uh, Richard's a techie guy by day, but he's, he's a drummer. So he knows music. He knows musicians. He's, you know, a huge kid of rock and roll loves, loves rock and roll. I mean, really lives for it. And he's an amazingly talented photographer. I like, mean, like, and when you say amazingly talented, just so people understand that don't know Richard, like he's gone and photographed the stones in recent right. years. So yeah. seriously talented dude. Yeah. Seriously talented dude. And so, you know, Richard and I hang out a little bit and we're buddies and Richard sat in on a project I did once and we got even to be better buddies. And, and, uh, I really enjoy using him a, because he gets music and musicians. I, I notice a lot that if you just grab a photographer, someone who is competent with a camera, you know, with professional gear, professional lights, oftentimes if they don't know musicians, especially in live ph photographs, things come out kind of flat. I mean, yep. they're, they're technically, you know, they're, they're focused, clear photos, but the moments that make a musical endeavor really cool or make a musician really resonant are, are, are different things that someone who knows musicians, at least to me, I find that, you know, they know, they know what to look for, but in these post pictures, you know, it really helps because, you know, Richard did smart things. Like he brought in some music and had some cool music playing when the guys arrived. Um, he kind of gets that musicians are, while they might be outgoing on stage, you know, the concept of getting their picture taken is kind of a harrowing thing. And so it kind of makes the environment fun and he kind of teases with us and, 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 uh, and laughs with us and he creates a really nice environment and he knows little subtle things about props and he kind of sees things in whatever room that we're in. And this year we did the photos, uh, my buddy, Keith Holland, Keith Holland guitars is a local, local guitar shop. They have a nice studio in the back where they do like, um, 
like performances and, and uh, recitals and that type of thing. And he let us use that that room to take our posed pictures. And then we went outside and took some some candid pictures. But it was just a really nice environment. I'm really happy. I've, I posted a couple of them on the House Rockers Facebook site so far that are, you know, the first couple of ones that are coming out. This is the 20th year of the House Rockers. So I'm like revamping our logo to get a special logo to put on T-shirts oh, for the nice. 20th year. Yeah. Get, you know, new photo. Yeah, we just launched a new website. So like a lot of those marketing things, you know, are going on to do the best that we can to continue to put forward a, you know, a fresh image and exciting image. But the thing about photographs that I thought were interesting you know, if you were to look at like a hundred semi pro cover bands, you would have a, a very high percentage of them on the train tracks against a brick wall. Yeah, <laughs> you know, totally. Uh, guys, totally. You know, yep. guys trying to look a little tougher than they probably are in their day job. <laughs> you know, there, there's kind of a theme to what people think are typical band photographs. And uh, the really valuable conversation that I have with Richard about preparing for the house rockers is we're an accessible bunch. We're, we're not trying to be something that we're not, um, in general, you know, they're not very, um, they're not very stoic photos. Although if you look at the photos that we had, one of our guys was probably out a little too late the night before, and you can kind of tell which one he is in our, <laughs> in our band photos. It happens. But, yeah. But even at that, it just kind of like mixes in that it's, you know, cause I include Bill, our sound guy in our photos. So it's 11 guys in the photos. Yep. And, uh, you know, kind of is what we are. I mean, you, you kind of get that. I think you get that reality. And the the, the keywords I, I express to Richard is we're a big band. So we should leverage the fact that there's so many people in the picture and kind of, you know, make it look, make it look big. And, you know, we are quite close and, you know, our vibe on stage is kind of about a, a, a close knit group of guys who are, who are experienced musicians who just kind of grip it and rip it. And that, that, you know, so not, not a lot of hardcore post stuff, a little bit more natural, relaxed, definitely not a lot of glaring, sullen, you know, yeah. You, know, yeah, you don't need that stuff. moody thing. That's not your image, right? That's, that's not, what not you, us. That's Again, not you. Some people right? might be really good at that. If that's your truth sure. and you can make that come through in a picture, all the more power to you. I, I find that a lot of bands try to make that their truth, but it's not their truth. I mean, you know, it's quite a bit different, you know, Metallica glaring into a camera than it is, you know, uh, uh, guys who are, you know, CPAs yeah. and, and dentists during the day, you know, that this is not their truth. You know, although, e although the guys in Metallica want, seem like they're pretty accessible guys, too. Like <laughs> they seem pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, they they don't and, and they're not well, moody dudes. Then, yeah. 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 And, and Thrax, you know, pick, pick mm. your pick your middle band. Right? No, I, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Or pick your so, pick your eighties, you know, emo band or whatever, like freaking the Cure with Robert Smith, like that, you know, that whole vibe is that's just, an image. That's, that's a very yes cultured, you know, cultivated image, and you know they they do that and that. But remember, that's in everything that they do. And actually, I think that's my point of all this yes. is this the to me the key to a successful band photo is if it accurately portrays what your brand is about. If your brand is about fun then it's fun. If your brand is about, you know, you know, hardcore, you know, metal, you know, yeah. Get your yeah. out type stuff. Then that's your, then that's your vibe. If that comes through your photos, if your band is a band that wears coordinated costumes or stuff like that. Yeah. Do that. Are you smiling? Photos. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, you know, I think thinking about those things is really helpful, but it's an uncomfortable thing. Like I said, you know, like we've talked about, like you can be a musician and, and have one persona on stage that is, you know, something that comes out of you in a very real way when you're on stage, but it's not you off stage. Can you capture that on stage person when you're not on stage, just taking a picture of a person? Right. And that's that sometimes just takes some work and a really good photographer will get that out of you as a thing. Yes. T I totally. mean, I find good photographers yeah. are psychologists. They kind of have to be. Well, it's it. They know that the pictures will come out better, and therefore, you know, people will be happier with their work if you're more relaxed. If you if you can get out of your own head, that's really what it what what it comes down to when you're having your picture taken. Is you need somebody to distract you so that you can just be you. And there you yeah, go. We had one picture that we took. Uh, so I always take a formal picture because you know when sure. people want to hire us for a wedding or a, you know a formal event. And so um, we had this one picture. So all all eleven of us in suits, and we're kind of in a row. So if you can picture five fanned in one direction, five fanned in the other direction, but we're really close in, yeah. right? And I am convinced 
Richard was messing with his camera to leave us really close in for an un- un- really uncomfortable <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> we, were, awesome. we were really close in to get a certain vibe out of us because he's just that darn smart. Yeah. And uh, and so the picture comes out is like, you know, yes, we're wearing suits, but we're not stiff. We, you know, we're having fun. And, you know, all the jokes you can imagine were, were being made. And, of course. And, uh, yeah. So uh, it, it was kind of a cool experience. I'm really happy with the way that the first few ones that he shared with me have come out. I posted one on the House Rockers Facebook page and it's getting a lot of good comments. We had one where we went out onto a street right outside the music store and he just said, just walk towards me, carry your instruments. And it just the color's nice. You know, the vibe is nice. The freshness is nice. And so I think it does a lot to connect to our brand. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I, I saw a couple of those pictures. They look fantastic. They, yeah, yeah, well, Richard's great. Yeah, I, I knew exactly who took them as soon as I saw them. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so yeah. speaking about bands and brands, what did you think of our conversation with Dan Medlin last week? Man, I love chatting with him. He is a really, obviously a really smart dude, really driven dude, understands who he is and, you know, how he and his band are perceived like talking about image, right there. He, he knows exactly what they do. I loved his comment about, you, you know, singing Copacabana every night and just making it his favorite song, at least while he's singing it, you know, that whole, that whole thing. It's just like a lot of self-awareness and a lot of drive is I think the key to their success. And, and he, un- he understands what's going on, you, you know, and that, I think that's, that's really important. Uh, to have that, you know, I mean, it's part of that self-awareness, but it's also clearly intentional for him to understand, OK, yeah, look, you know, we need to have a stage. Let's think about this. Let's let's be let's be present when we're making this decision. OK, yep, this is what we want that, you know, now it exists. Let's go get it. Now we'll have it. And, you know, all that stuff. Really smart, dude. Yeah, I agree. You know, the thing that surprised me the most was the, the comment about uh, going out and getting corporate gigs. I really thought Knowing, I, I know Dan a little, you know, it's not like we hang out all the time. Sure. And, um, and I've been on a couple of bills with him and I, you know, this focus comes off him. And I really thought that he was much more, um, proactive and aggressive. You know, I asked him that question, like, do you, do you knock on doors of, of, you know, local companies and make sure they know who you are? And when he kind of backed off of that, I, I was really surprised. And so the, the, the net net was, is if your band is good, if your band looks presentable and looks presentable all the time, I loved he was saying about, you know, for him, no jeans on stage. Yeah, don't look like um, but also don't look like a waiter. Right. So and don't look like you and look like you you're worth the money that you're asking for. That was it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And also, you know, pick repertoire that will work for corporate gigs, look great, play great. And that's the essence of, you know, what you and I have been saying for almost four years here. I mean, that's the basic, the basic things. You take your ego out of it. You put on the right clothes to perform. You play the music that will get people happy and you know get them to pay you. I mean, that's the core of what makes for a good career, you know, trying to sell a cover band you yeah. know, into corporate parties. You know, yeah. it actually is that simple. I mean, and, yeah, and I was I surprised. Think, I think there's more to it, though. I, I think I mean, he is a natural and also ruthless self promoter. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think he may not realize quite the amount of promotion that he does. I, I truly believe his answer was sincere when you asked him, you know, are you aggressively going after this? And he says, no, it just comes to us. Well, I don't think this is one of those if you build it, they will come sort of things because there's plenty of other places that they could go to, you know, to get their, you know, the corporations could go to get their their, you know, entertainment needs handled. And I I really think that because we've seen him, I I, you pointed out to me and I I was almost sure of this, but I didn't want to say anything during the interview. But I I wound up seeing that band when I came to uh, a couple of years ago when I came and played a couple of gigs with you. We wound up seeing them at um, at that your park. park, Yeah. Yeah. And I remember them being very vocal about who they were, how to find them. Like every three songs, if there was a break in the action, it was where Pop Fiction come visit us. You know, I think it's Pop Fiction Live or whatever it is, you know. Right. And, And and that was constant throughout the gig. And it was like, yeah. And I remember thinking like we slash fling, we need to be better about this. Like that needs that was almost the default thing that was said. It was like, hey, thanks so much for coming. We're glad you're here. We're Pop Fiction. Right. It was just like before whatever they were thinking of saying was said, it was that that was the the preface to everything. 
And right. I think that's part of why those corporate gigs just magically appear in their lap is they make it easy for people to remember who they are. And, and so they, they are aggressive about that. And I think that's okay. I like that's, you know, that's how you market yourself. It's one way you market yourself. There you are putting on your show. The worst thing you could do is finish that show and have somebody out there not remember who you were. Yeah. What came through with the conversation is Dan, takes care of his business. Yep. Right. He, he's very keenly aware. And like he's, like he said, every year, how do we grow it a little bit? So, you know, invest in this, invest in that. And, and that's really smart. Um, he is a, he is a driven guy, I believe. I mean, obviously he has a tech background and, and, uh, you know, he kind of gets the game and, I, I'm not surprised at his success. He's put everything in place to be a success. Like I said, his band is really good. Right. Uh, they're you know good players. They all look great. They interact in a really pleasant way on stage and they play those songs that people want. And then, you know, Dan puts it out there. I'm a corporate band. So yes. if you're looking for one, how do you like this? So that's it. It, it, it makes sense that he's a success, but it's not an accident. I think he works really hard. That's that. Yeah. That, I think that's the right way to say it. This is not an accident. Um, and it's not just, I put together a good band, therefore it gets work, right? That that's I, I I think that's an important takeaway is it's not it doesn't end there. That's in fact table stakes, right? You're a good band, you present yourself well, awesome. Now, what do you do next, right? And that that's really where where the, the you know, that that's where your money's made is is from And I've had forward. conversations with musicians who are like it doesn't matter what you wear on stage if the it what matters is what you sound like. How how on pitch are the vocals? And and you know, if that, I If that were true, you could just sell records. True. Right? Uh, it, well, it, I mean, if you have an, if you have a live event and you were going to pick somebody cuz you wanted to have someone, you could you could just sell records, but I think the point of this is Yeah. You know, I, the point I'm trying to make is I know people who are great musicians, great musicians, and they really de-emphasize the value of presentation. Yep. And um, I think, you know, everyone's entitled to do what they want to do, you know, whatever, whatever path they want to choose. But I think like in many things in life, be careful of uh, falling into the trap of confirmational bias yes. that you are convincing yourself you're right. Because I, I do, I definitely think if you look, if you take in enough data, the bands who get the most corporate work are kind of the most polished in yeah. all ways, including presentation. And I will, I'll share something I've learned from all my time, my recent time in theater. And that's that, you know, when you are coming up with your costume and it is a costume, like whatever you want to call it, what you're wearing on stage is a costume. It might be your, you know, jeans and T-shirt that you mowed the lawn in. Well, what you want people to believe that's what you want people to think is your brand. Correct. You're so great. You're so great. You don't have to work about worry about what you're wearing right. because your music is going to be that great. But whatever your costume is, you have to overdo it. Like it, what may seem, you know, you have to remember that most people aren't going to be two feet away from you. And when you're standing in front of your mirror, you know, that's what you're, you're what, maybe a foot and a half away from your mirror. So three foot difference between you and the person in the mirror, like things need to be way over the top there so that from 30 feet away, it reads well, you know, and yeah. little, little nuances are fine as long as they don't get in the way of the big picture. And, and it really it like I've learned a lot. I'm not and I'm not an expert at this. What I've learned is that I'm not an expert at this. Like I, <laughs> I definitely need people to help me when it's time to like costume up because it. I, I don't think enough about all of that stuff. But, you know, it's like if you know, if you know what you don't know, that's a huge help. And 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 then getting someone that can help you and just thinking about it in that way, like what's it going to look like from 30 feet away? Does it look cool? Does it look like what you want it to look like? Or, you know, does your cool, maybe kitschy, ironic T-shirt that someone might notice if you're sitting across the table from them, like, what does that read like from 20, 30 feet away? Does it just look right. like something you mowed the lawn in? And if so, is that the image you want or did you want something a little more polished than that? And if so, you got to think about it that way. It, and it's it's a you know, it's a lesson. It's not a natural thing. At least wasn't for me. So, yeah, it deserves it deserves your consideration. Like I said, if you're going to dress, if you want corporate gigs, you dress for corporate gigs. If you want neighborhood house parties or block parties. You know, there's and you're just like the neighborhood musician yeah. who is available then just for that. And, and uh, you know, 
I always think, I guess, you know, what you just said just rings really true for me. I, I always try, right. I try to just look presentable, right. I don't overdo it. I don't underdo it, but you know, I try because to me, the, the, performing and and respecting the stage and respecting the audience. I guess that's what my brand is. I want, I want to communicate that I, I, the light bulb just went on when you were talking Dave, because you know, I, why do I dress the way I dress? Well, and cause not everything is just about corporate gigs for me. It's literally, you know, what, what my personal brand yeah. is, is about, uh, I res- I have, this is how I express my respect for the, for the privilege of being able to get on a stage. Well, it, it, I think it was Jackson Brown, if, if not, I'll attribute it to him anyway, is, is that, you know, I think he, he was the one that said, look, these people spent their time and their money to come out and see us. The least I can do is put on a nice shirt. <laughs> right. There you go. There you go. Hey, we, um, it, on the tech side of the conversation with Dan, we had a great comment from Kevin that actually resonated with a lot of the things I wanted to sort of dig back into But uh, so we'll go into that. But first, I want to talk about our sponsor this week, which is ExpressVPN. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, ExpressVPN.com slash GigGab gets you three months for free with your one year subscription. Now, a VPN is super important to us musicians. Why? What is a VPN? You might ask Dave. Well, Dave will tell you (laughs) a VPN is a service that tunnels your internet connection from wherever you are out from wherever is providing you with internet. So if you're at like a coffee shop or you're at a club where they've got, you know, some club wide Wi-Fi that probably is being run by someone that's not all that technically astute. They might not have set up security on it the right way, or maybe they are too technically astute and they want to know what you're getting to. The VPN creates a secure tunnel between your device and, and the outside world. And that way, whoever's managing that internet connection, whoever also happens to be on that internet connection, you know, if there's no password, it means everybody can see everybody else's traffic in many cases. Well, you might not want that, right? I don't want that. And that's why I use ExpressVPN because it creates that secure tunnel to get things out. And ExpressVPN, I've tried, look, I'm a geek, right? I've tried a lot of VPN services. ExpressVPN is by far and away my favorite. It's the fastest to use that I've ever used. It's super simple. One click, you install an app on your uh, computer or your tablet or your phone, and you just one click. Once the app's installed and you're done, the connection is secured. Everything's good to go. And you can do whatever you need to do, connecting to your email, connecting to your bank, connecting to whatever you need to connect to without having to worry that someone you know, local or whoever's managing that local network is sniffing and figuring out what you're doing and perhaps even seeing passwords and things like that. And protecting yourself with ExpressVPN costs less than seven bucks a month. You've got to check it out. So protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash gig gab. That's E X P R E S S V P N dot com slash G I G G A B for three months free with a one year package. Visit expressvpn dot com slash gig gab to learn more. And of course, our thanks to ExpressVPN for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, ExpressVPN. Yeah, man. All right. Uh, so Kevin had uh, some great feedback here. Uh, he says, uh, he says a quick note regarding the damn Neblin from pop fiction. You just had, he says it was good to hear some of his thoughts. He says, and I had to get a little chuckle because I've done a lot of what uh, he's also done. He says, that is I've set up that independent uh, in-ear monitor system that can either drive front of house or can have tails to a separate front of house system. He says, just like Dan, we use an X 32 rack for our monitors. He says, most everything is pre-cabled, uh, though I have sub snakes for some instrument inputs so that things like drums can run direct. He says our guitar player uses a model or bass uses a rack mount and so on. Uh, he says our drummer has internal mics in his kit and we have a sub snake for him to feed back to the rack. Super smart stuff. Um, and, you know, I like as Dan was explaining this, it made so much sense to me. The idea of no matter what stage you're on, you plug your stuff into your rack and your monitors are exactly the same 
uh, as they would be anywhere else because you're using the same gear to do that. And then if someone wants to go front a house with a separate system, well, they can take splits on those feeds and having that all set up and ready to go. I was thinking actually a lot about you, Paul, as, as this came to mind. I mean, I definitely want to do it for me, but you know, you're always talking about how when you do these festival gigs, it's a disaster trying to get set up and get a good monitor mix and all yep. of that stuff with it because you're dealing with, Someone that doesn't know your band potentially and a system that isn't your system. There's no reason it can't be your system. Right. If you if you kind of split things this way. And the cool part is you don't have to split things. Right. You could use that X32 rack as your front of house system when it's just you doing sound. And and then if somebody else, like I said, if somebody else wants theirs, well, you've got the tails for them and they're good to go. But um it makes life way easier. I, I think I think this could this could make a huge difference for you. Now, I say that knowing full well, having experienced, you know, the house rockers and being on stage. I know some of your guys don't use in ears yet to, to do this right. I think in ears are almost mandatory. I mean, I guess you could. You could run it with wedges this way or a mix of wedges and in-ears, but in-ears would make this super easy because even when you're on a, a you know, a strange stage, you don't have to worry about, oh, what are we going to use for monitor wedges or how do we tune them? You don't have to worry about any of that. You just put your ears in and you're done. There's no feedback to worry about. None of that. Um, right. But it, that also solves any volume problems you might have with stage volume, which I might think the house rockers might hmm. might find an issue with that what are you so, saying dave i'm I, you're still you're the loudest band on stage i've ever played with but i don't know what that means you know i don't know that's i've only played with a few bands so i don't know yeah and the funny thing is i wonder why we're the loudest hmm. you know i, I know. You know we have it's it's your keyboard have, player it's nick oh wow yeah no no i mean think about it he's got three monitor wedges for him he's got one at his feet Right. That I think just has vocals. And then he's it, at least when I was playing with you guys, he has two in the air that are like 10 feet away from him, blasting his keyboards and perhaps anything else back at him. And that that was what made things super loud on stage. Interesting. Yeah. It's just I always, thought it's, I always thought it's it's the horns trying to get above the drums so they can hear themselves. Hmm. But most of your horn players use in ears, don't they? Only two of them do. Oh, oh, interesting. I thought they all did. And, and not the trumpets. Oh, Oh, these guys are going to deafen themselves, man. Like that's the yeah. other thing about in ears, right? And I, I don't mean to get all preachy here, but like save your hearing, use in ears. Let me preach a little, you know. Um, so Russ bought some West tones when he was down at Nam last week, and so oh, Russ nice. wants to give it a try. And um, and one of the trumpet players is expressing interest in wanting to give it a try. So I think we'll nudge there. I think I think Nick. It's, I mean, again, he's just so into his ambient. I get it. No. It's different. There's no like, and this is the problem for anyone that is moving like, you know, that, that has been playing for years and years and then moves to in ears. It's you, it does not sound the same. Like, like right. There's just no way. And there are, there are effects boxes that you can put in that kind of give you a little more spatial, you know, ambience to that. You can, you can hang ambient mics to blend that in so that you're doing it, but all at a lower volume, but no matter what you do, it does not sound the same as when you have a monitor wedge, you know, whatever, three feet, 10 feet, whatever away from you. It It's a different thing, but it is better in terms of your hearing and in terms Absolutely. of stage volume. I, I, I'll, here's the key. When I have a good night with my in-ears, right? So again, I've, I have, I've shared my, a litany of problems getting to good for me, but, but I do that even on a good night when I have them in and I'm using them. Yep. Once you take one out, you know, I say to myself, well, I just want to, you know, feel like what it's on stage. And all of a sudden you feel the adrenaline on your stage and you just kind of feel the rush and you kind of get that more tactile touch of the audience. It's really hard to put them back in, man. It's really hard. Yep. I know. I, you're absolutely right. I, yes. All of those things are true. It, it, you just have to be, it, at least for me and anyone that I've seen that's gone through it successfully is you just have to be diligent about it. It's like, yep, nope, just put them in, be, you know, ruthless, deal with it, put them in and you're good. Yeah. Cool. But it's not easy. I get, I get the premise and I, you know, the, the idea of being able to simplify our sound checks and walk in, I, you know, I get it. It's interesting to me that every single place we go, 
it seems our sound checks take the same amount of time and the same amount of tweaking because every room seems to present a few different things, you know, ambiently, you totally. know, how far apart we are. And so that but concept if, if you of being got able rid to, of wedges and only had to tune front of house, I bet that that gets way uh, simpler. Right. I mean, it would have to. I would think. think. Well, yeah, I would think, think. exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. So digging deeper into the mailbag going one episode back, we have two pieces of feedback. The first is from DK who, uh, he says, I listened to GigGab196 today and heard the segment about the Soundcraft UI 24R. He says, I got this for my working band a couple months ago and I've used it probably 15 times now. The unit, this is a the mixer that I, I got the sort of deep dive into while I was at CES and we'll dig right. a little deeper ourselves too. Uh, he says, this unit is a beast and it sounds great. Uh, he says, I also spent a number of years working as a front of house monitor engineer for production companies. So I'm always the default sound guy, no matter what band I'm in. Gigging out. He says, I'm a bassist and have had to do mix side stage and on the fly for years using traditional mixers, having to do that thing where you run out with your instrument on a wireless, listen, run back, make an adjustment, etc. He says, I can finally mix a sound check once whilst playing my bass with the tablet out in the audience area with me. The preamps sound good. They're not great, but definitely on par with your average mid-level consoles. Once you get over the learning curve of the interface, it's actually pretty intuitive. Having each channel come complete with its own outboard rack is amazing as well. I never have to worry about compression patches ever again. He says, I managed to convince the guys to switch to Shure IEMs, the PSM 300s, about a year ago, uh, but with only two aux outs on our old co console, we all had to share a monitor mix. Uh, he says, now with eight aux outs and the ability to for them to manage their own mixes, I couldn't be happier. The guitarists can have now have as much of themselves as they want, and I don't have to play the mix negotiator anymore. And mm. to, to our previous point, he says, switching from wedges to in-ears, uh, plus now having this unit has made our stage impeccably clean and streamlined. We have no stage volume as everyone goes direct into the PA after their preamps, and it's enabled us to get in and out of venues in a fraction of the time with a quarter of the gear to haul around. I can finally require, retire the card table that has taken up a sizable footprint while holding my old 24-channel Mackie. He says, the media player that's built into this mixer is awesome to have as well. He says, I loaded up an 8-gig flash drive with about 400 MP3s, each separated into different playlists for different situations, venues, appropriateness. And all I have to do now is just hit a mute group and click play on the media player for intermission music. The fact that this doesn't have an app to install is a major plus uh, that that mixer uses just a web interface, uh, web interface from wherever you are. He says since firmware updates and version changes won't suddenly bork anything. There are a few caveats. He says, while the unit does have built in wireless, it is crap. It drops out on you, even in environments with direct line of sight. He says, so I've added an old wireless router and Velcroed it to the back. Solved the problem. He says, like uh, 10 generations into Wi-Fi technology now. How could they how could they possibly have bad Wi-Fi? Uh, if they just put a weak Wi-Fi radio in that thing, uh, that would that would probably do it. Uh, I've seen that in other sort of, you know, all in one type solutions where it's like, oh, hey, here's our Wi-Fi. It's like, eh, yeah, but not, you know. So that's good to know that that at least for in his experience, the built in Wi-Fi is not uh, not up to par. So. so what do they do? It just has a USB port and they just connect another router to it. It's actually got two Ethernet ports on it. So you just get a normal router and you Ethernet right in and you just connect to that instead of the built in Wi-Fi. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and he says, uh, I also have seen that it experiences some lag at random times too. He says you can actually watch this while monitoring the VU meters, but it generally only bites you in the butt if, when you're trying to do a fine adjustment on a fader and it doesn't move so smoothly. I've seen that with the Mac. Actually, I've seen it with all of them. Um, if, if there's a Wi-Fi lag or something, you know, you can try and adjust a fader and it doesn't quite go as you're going, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, Yeah. He says he he says uh, even with the few quirks that it has for a thousand bucks, it's an awesome pickup for a working band that does its own mix. He says it's made our QSC K12 with uh, K sub stacks sound phenomenal. And we've gotten more and more compliments from both patrons and venue owners about the quality of our performance and sound since switching. Well, wow, that's good to hear. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for that, man. Success story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 it doesn't surprise me after learning what I learned about that thing. It it really does seem built for, you know, it, it feels like it's the product of iterative design, right? Where it's been through, 
like people that are actually using this thing out in the field and like, oh, yeah, we need this. OK, cool. Let's add it. And the nice part is with it, you know, the interface being all software, um, you know, the limits are are only in the hardware. So that's it's pretty flexible. So, yeah, pretty good. Cool. Yeah. And uh, let's see one more piece of feedback that I think might lead into a little bit of a discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Martin asks. He says, uh, after listening to episode 196 and your discussion about fan relationship expectations and losing fans when they don't get what they want, it got me thinking about other discussions you've had over the years. He says, Paul, you specifically have been very vocal about your political feelings in the last two years. Granted, working in the Bay Area, most of the population probably shares your views. So here's my question. Have you ever lost fans and or gigs? Because of your political stance or views. So I'll let you answer first. I, I have my own experiences with this, but but go. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> there it is. Okay. <laughs> a- any more color to add to that? Well, here's the thing. Like in everything in life, you know, it's um everyone here in the United States is is probably thinking about politics to some degree on a it's it's in our face. It's it, the genie is out of the bottle. Sure. And the relative value, you know, on the one hand, you say, oh, you know, it's just our country's democracy, you know, no big deal. Why would anybody want to talk about that or express their feelings? That's one hand. The other hand is. Unless it's the right place, you're probably not changing any minds. And I'm keenly aware of this. And so, you know, a snarky comment that might get you a laugh from 65 percent of the room 25% of the room is uncomfortable because they don't want any politics in their entertainment and 10% of the room, whatever number I'm up left with, you know, you, you just said something that was against their team. Um, that, uh, I don't know. Sometimes it feels again, it goes, it's like the same conversation to me as the first conversation we had today about your photo, I guess in all these things, you get to decide as a, as a musician, we are basically all small businessmen and you get to decide on every, on every decision you make, how does it affect your brand? Is your brand that you're that smart ass guy that, 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 you know, keenly awoke, you know, uh, you know, artistic guy who, who, you know, your art is where you express your views of the world in all ways. Are you, you know, worried about, losing customers and losing fans. And, you know, you're going to conduct yourself that way because your truth is I, I play music to put food on the table. I don't think there's a wrong to this. I don't think there's a right to this. I think it's, um, but but some self-awareness is important. That's it. That's it. Self-awareness. And so, you know, I, um, when something comes out, if it's been a day where there's a lot of stuff happening in the world and, or in the country and, and it's on my mind and it comes out, it, tends to come out in a fairly organic way, which I would say is okay. You know, part of truth, my wife hates it. (laughs) And, uh, you know, she definitely lets me, you know, why did you have to do why, why, why? And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who think that they don't want any politics in their entertainment. There's a lot of people who are just really numb from the amount of politics in their life all the time. I get that as well. And I guess that's the thing is, you know, you, we are all small businessmen making, making, minute to minute decisions about the representation of our brand. Yeah. And if you're okay with it, you're okay with it. If you're not okay with it, don't do it. Yeah. It, it's, it, this is an interesting thing. Um, you know, I've always kept my political v- views fairly reserved in terms of my public persona, but that's probably because I don't really fit neatly into one camp or, you know, the other. Right. And, and I've just seen it do more harm than good, but it, where I really learned the value of just keeping it out of entertainment was when I was playing in Austin. I moved to Austin when I was in my early twenties. Certainly I'd played, you know, my fair share of gigs before that, but, um, but moving to Austin, you know, that's an interesting city because it's the capital of Texas, very Republican, you know, uh, right wing. Yep. Uh, and 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 so Austin has a, a huge population of people that lean that way. And then also Austin's like a major college slash hippie slash musician town where the, the again, the majority of those folks sort of lean the other way. And and so it really is kind of a I, I don't know if it's a 50 50 split, but it's everyone is well represented. And um, 
And what's interesting is being in a restaurant or a nightclub or, you know, whatever. And you know full well that like, OK, those people lean that way. Those people lean this way. And they all I, like it was fascinating watching this happen night and night again where people would be like, oh, yeah, we're just here for the music. And and they they would, you know, watching these people that would fight like vehemently with each other were there a political discussion happening being totally bonded with each other about, you know, wow, that dude can play guitar or whatever sort of made me realize, OK, th this is why I don't want to to get involved in, in any of that. That said, I have seen it and the lesson has actually been reinforced to me. Um, Paul, you're not the only one of my podcast co-hosts who is, uh, you know, happy to express your political views on Facebook. Uh, John Braun, my my co-host on Mac Geek Gab is very vocal about his uh, political leanings. And uh, we've seen and he, not so much in the show, but on social media and pretty much everywhere else. And we've seen, you know, quite a few listeners over the 14 years we've been doing that show go away because they didn't agree with him. Um, and it, it really isn't a part of the show, just like it. In fact, it's far less of a part of that show than it is this one. But um, but, you know, if people don't agree with him, then, you know, they don't want to listen to his advice about computers. And, you know, that's it's not my place to 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 judge that outcome. It's like, yeah, it's that, like that's you. It's fine that you do you. But, yeah, I, it just like I, I, I feel like it's almost like potty humor. If you're using it as an entertainment vehicle, it's it's low hanging fruit. Right. Like, you know that you can probably get X percent of the people in the room to cheer you on if you just say a thing that offends the rest of the people in the room, you know, and um, and I feel like there's there's better ways to do that for me. Like, it's so just check my this style. Out. Yeah. Um, that's the best way to say this. Beware of the law of unintended consequences. Mm. Right. So that that that's this listener. Yeah. That this listener said, you know, Paul, you're clearly making your, your political views known. Um, it's actually always interesting to me. And actually, I've gotten that kind of feedback about that, you know, on Facebook and on Twitter, where, where I certainly are, are more vocal. But here's the deal. I don't even think you know, Dave, my politics, right? I, you, you and I, when we're together, you don't know my politics. You, you know, you know, you clearly know what I don't like, but right. I don't think you know my politics, right? No, I don't. That's right. Yeah. yeah but people like make listener. it, people think they know your politics. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm actually not comfortable with that. So, so mm. the net result of me saying something is giving people a, per, um, a perception of me that is not what I want them to think about my brand. Right? right. I wouldn't mind them thinking that I'm, I'm smart and woke and, and, uh, and uh, you know, passionate about our country's democracy. I wouldn't mind that being my brand. I'd think that's fairly accurate. But if, if I get saddled with crazy left-wing guy, that's not my politics actually. And that's not my brand. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't wave an Obama flag on stage when Obama was, you know, that, that wasn't my brand then. I didn't even, I was playing music when Bush was, was president. And I, I don't remember ever saying anything from the stage uh, when Bush was president either. So, um, but no one remembers the, that, you know what I mean? Like no one in the room, if you happen to make a comment about Trump, you know, our current president here in the U S that, that it's very easy for people to jump to a conclusion that it sounds like might not be entirely accurate about you. And that's that. You know, there's your unintended. And that's it. Yep. It got it got it, it has gotten away from me to a certain degree. I think it's sad that we you know, that there can't be those conversations. I think I'm very keenly aware. It doesn't make everybody happy. I do want to make everybody happy with music, though. And so, you know, it's. um yeah. You know, is the best thing stay away from it entirely? My gut tells me that you should be able to say anything in a tasteful way. And it just doesn't make any smart sense to alienate. Right. Anybody who is paid to see you play music. That doesn't make sense. I'm not playing large arenas where people say, well, you know, he, you know, here's my money. And I know what he's saying. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. She doesn't understand why any entertainer has to do that. And I'm like, well, some entertainers, that's part of who they are. That's I mean, totally. they, they, 
Right. Totally. And so yep. when you put your money down, you're going to get that. You should know you're going to get that. And if you don't want to get that, don't put your money down. Yeah. If you if you were going to an REM show any time after like Green came out and you were surprised that there was an element of the show that was largely political, that's your fault, not theirs. You know? Yep. Yep. And that's that's OK. As long as it's OK. And if it's not, then don't go. You know, that's, that's it. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that, that that's my thing is uh uh, truth, you know, is it who you are? Are you aware of the law of unintended consequences? Are you prepared to, you know, are you so passionate about who you are that you're ready to try and, you know, remember if you, if you get a guy to walk out of you, he's also not buying beer at that bar and you've, you know, hurt the guy who's employing you, yep. you, you know, right. Well, so, and, 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 you know, to extend the law of unintended consequences, right. You on stage say, I, you know, I lean left, I lean right. What, like whatever the the interpretation of that is, if patrons don't like that, they may then also assume, ah, this, you know, the manager or the owner of this club is the same way. And I also therefore don't agree with them. I'm n not just I'm walking out tonight, but I'm never coming back here. Yep. Right. I and actually, my last gig, I was sitting in a bar before we played and a guy yeah. came up. Hey, Paul is going. And he goes, hey, isn't our president great? Isn't he, you know, can you imagine all the great things he's doing? And he's, you know, he doesn't get the credit. And he, and he literally, and I said, I just paused and said, you know, I'm not a Trump guy. And um, he goes, well, then you're being brainwashed by the, you know, just went down and he dug in and he really wanted to do it with me. Right. And uh, and I was just like, dude, this is not going to take us anywhere. You know, let's just enjoy the music tonight. And I guess, you know what? I should take my own advice and, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's what I should do. I mean, again, no yeah. one's paying me. So I guess the, the extract from that is we're here to, we're here to enjoy some music tonight. I'm a, I'm an intelligent guy and I do have an opinion about this. If you can find a way to say that in a way that doesn't alienate some and, you know, can connect with others, then you're a better person than I am. Cause I haven't found the right way to well, right maybe, tone, like, strike with that. Like maybe in, in that scenario where that, you know, someone comes up and, and clearly spouts their leanings at you and is looking for some sort of a response and not responding at all would be, you know, awkward and perhaps even rude, you know, saying, yeah. Hey, you know, I, I made it a rule. I, I appreciate what you're saying. That's great. I made it a rule a long time ago to keep politics out of gigs. It never works out well. So maybe you and I can talk about this another time. There you go. Right. You're such and, a diplomat, man. Uh, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> good at spewing BS is what it is. I don't know. <laughs> like we are not going to have this conversation and I'm not going to offend you that we're not having this conversation. That's the goal, you know. But um, we're yeah. not going to argue about not having the conversation. That's the thing is, right. Yeah. Because because there is a, a it's very easy to say, man, I don't want to talk about this. And then they assume that, you know, you're, that you're against them. You're and, them. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's like, no. Hey, look, man, I'm just here to play music. I, I kind of got to be focused on that. If I start getting all into politics, even if it's with someone I agree with now, that person may hear that and think, you know, you may have led them to believe you agree with them. That's not what you said. You just said, even if it's with someone I agree with, uh, you know, I, I just I, I got to keep my head in the music. I, I hope you can appreciate that. And maybe that's it. You know, it's like now I just got to be here. I got to be present. And this is where I this is my thing for tonight. I don't know. I don't. People don't do that to me. Like I, I'm literally making this up on the spot because I, yep. I, because I don't, I don't attract that kind of uh, thing. Right. I also have a weird genetic thing where I am incapable of getting emotionally riled up about any sort of national politics. It's actually kind of weird. Local politics, I will fly off the handle, like right. probably unreasonably so. Um, and maybe that's my uh, something I need to work on. But um, but national politics, I just can't do it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Uh, the limited amount that I have, you, one of my closest friends, don't know my politics. Nope. Right. But you know what I don't like, but you I don't do. know why I don't like it. Correct. That, that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yep. And that's OK. Also, by the way, mm -hmm. like, yeah, we're doing fine. We're doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> We've known each other a very long time. It's all good. Right. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, speaking of very long times, this episode has gone on a very long time. Fifty three, almost fifty four minutes. So I think we're uh, I think we're at the end unless there's anything else that you need, my friend. No, I just think it's great that people have been sending us those notes. It seems like they're getting more constant 
you know, lately, a lot more things that uh, we know that you guys are listening and you guys are have thoughts about what we're talking about. So please keep them coming because we really love it. There's the best part of doing this is knowing that uh, our voices are being heard. Our conversations are resonating with people around the world who are doing the same thing. We are just trying to put a little happiness in the world with some music. That's it. Yeah. And uh, and feel free, please email us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And of course, you can message us on Facebook or, you know, join our Facebook group at uh, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook, whatever, uh, you know, whatever works for you. So, yeah, it's good. We'd love to hear from you via any channels. Just make sure there are channels that get to us. Don't yeah. don't put a flag up over your house. We might not see it. You know, we try. Semaphores. Semaphore, maybe. <laughs> Got to learn a new language, maybe, in 2019. That'd be a cool way to always be performing with semaphores. Yeah, it would. <laughs> 